So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a CSI organized visiting speaker uh, seminar, and um, and first of all, I want to to thank everyone who who, are, who arrived. Uh, we have been decimated for two reasons. One is uh, the time of the year when students when everyone is is uh, in panic writing writing their uh, assi assignments. So several students came to apologize to me that I have to talk about Kelly because I'm afraid of, of for my future. Uh, and that, that's, that's the one. And the other reason is uh, it's double actually that we moved it from the usual Wednesday to, to Thursday. And the third is I, I believe the unfortunate uh, uh, out of the students from the institute uh, new norm. Which is which is there after six o'clock. So this this may may also affect. Uh, unfortunately, at the we will we will see that how it works. Uh, so who are here are clearly the Haas or the official. Uh, official. He may say it doesn't make it official. So you are the Haas or Haas, the elite of the elite, and you deserve. And by being the Haas or Haas, you deserve the Haas or Haas of. of uh, Abu Hasul Has. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Although I like Abu, I want sometimes. Who is who is one of my favorite scholars? No, this is okay. Yeah, it probably I uh, haven't been applied to what I have just said. And then, uh, then, uh, well, he had sent out his microbio. Uh, I hope this is a. Is it okay as a term, microbio? I think so. Okay, I invented it, and then, <laughs> then I wasn't really, but being a native speaker, I'm always embarrassed by my own. But it's not a microbiology. Yeah, but then it has this, 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 not this that part of mine. Yeah, it, it's meant to be fun, and I never know whether my jokes are only, are fun or only stupid in English. So he's professor of Islamic studies in the Department of Theology and Religious Structures at Georgetown University in Washington. Uh, works in the area of Islamic ethics and intellectual history. is currently completing a monograph on political theology and Islamic history. But this talk is already for, from the new project, which is on, on emotions, which is a very, very new topic on the field. And, and uh, it's, it's great that, that uh, Paul is one book ahead. So we get a talk of, of the next book, not the one which is, which is coming out now. And, uh, and uh, what I did, mean, but we didn't put, he has all this very interesting website on the, uh, what you can, can consult on the uh, Theo Humanism Project and the, the uh, study of the religions across civilizations, a blog on national, a nation need of, need of theology, and so on. And what we didn't put into the, uh, what is the, the books, what he already published, Authored actually, not edited books, studies, but authored the construction of knowledge in Islamic civilization, Sufism and politics, power, uh, power of the power of spirituality. Uh, third one is the common ground, Islam, Christianity, and religious pure, pure, pluralism. No. Yes, and then skepticism in Islam, uh, in classical Islam, moments of confusion, and now comes. Uh, the theology, political theology. political theology, and then emotions. So, well, quite a thing. Uh, and then I will have to advertise three things. Uh, one, one is what I sent out in an email that you can actually have a private discussion, uh, probably even now, but semi-private. Seven, right? That's in the common room. Because, because uh, Paul, Paul uh, I asked Paul and he was very, he kindly offered to, to come up tomorrow morning uh, and sit here for an hour in the, in, the, in the common room. Please spread this news because that's now that anyone can talk to, to Paul and Heck and it's not to have a, well, you can present whatever thoughts, ideas, projects you have at any level. And he will, he will give his feedback on it. You can, you can possibly even send an email in advance, but he won't have much time to yeah. do. Yeah, I mean, I don't have their email, so I, yeah. I mean, 
I think you all caught the email from Sarah. I sent this out, and, and Paul's email is here. In any event, it's more a chance for me to learn about your research. So, oh. yeah, um, I don't know how much useful feedback I'll have, but I, I, it'd be a great delight to learn more about what you're doing. OK. Yeah, first lesson on blasting. OK. Uh, yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you to the Center for uh, Arabic and Islamic Studies here at uh, Exeter for inviting me, especially Ithvan. Uh, we've been talking uh, for some years uh, for me to come, and finally it worked out. So thank you for your persistence um, and for uh, yeah, everyone in the Center at the Institute uh, yeah, for welcoming me, and, and, and thank you to all of you uh, for coming. Uh, I, I've actually given various versions of this talk or other versions, other areas of weeping in Islam um, in other countries and I did three, three continents. I gave it once in uh, North Africa and once in West Asia and here is, I guess, I don't know, is this Europe or whatever, whatever it is. So, um, I, and I get wonderful different perspectives from each audience, so I really look forward to hearing how you um, how you respond to this. Um, yeah, so I'll talk, uh, talk, just throw a lot of information at you for 30 minutes, and then, and then together um, we'll look at a, a particular passage more, more closely. So um, today I'd like to open a, um, a broad conversation on how weeping works in Islam. So yes, we're talking about emotions and religiosity. Um, you know, this is a project that's trying to um, open the door more widely for the study of the history of Wijdan uh, in Islam. How do we study the history of Wijdan uh, in Islam? So it's a little treated question, but one I believe that has much to offer. Um, there are two broad categories, I believe, of lament in the tradition. One is lament for sin, uh, the other for lost glory. Both types, as depicted in literature, are not only about emotions, but also about ethics. One weeps for one's sins with hope that God will respond mercifully, that one will be forgiven and be granted new life, or one weeps for lost glory, the destruction of one's city, the demise of the caliphate, uh, the, death of fellow, <coughs> the, the death of fellow warriors, battle comrades, <coughs> with despair that all is lost, but also uh, to incite others to exact revenge against those who have humiliated one's group by stripping it of its worldly glory. Today I'll speak about the first category, weeping for one's sins, particularly tears that not only attract divine mercy, but also transfer it to others. So we're talking about a kind of emotionality that is penitential, but also redemptive in nature and purpose. Uh, the issue I emphasize is partly historical, um, literature of all kinds from Islam's past includes references to weeping. I'm overwhelmed at how large a share of the tradition weeping has. Uh, so how are we to read the depictions of tears in the historical literature? Let me begin with Ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, a child of the Mediterranean region, born in 1147 near Nablus, died in Damascus in 1223. He traveled more than once to Baghdad, where on his first, on his first visit, he had contact with Abu Qadr al-Jilani, uh, the holy man of the city. So Ibn Qudama was heir to a tradition with a geography that faced the Mediterranean, but that also included Baghdad. Um, Ibn Qudama is most commonly remembered as a jurist, but he also compiled a large collection of reports entitled Sensitivity of the Heart and Weeping, Kitab al wal Buka. This compilation is best situated within a heritage of pious weeping in Islam, one quite vast, which was first consolidated, it seems, in another collection, also entitled Sensitivity of the Heart and Weeping, which was compiled by Ibn Abi Adunya in the 9th century. So we're talking about a distinct heritage of weeping in Islam that stands apart not only from the heritage of lament for lost glory, but also from the Shi tradition of lament over the death of Hussein at Karbala. Many of the reports in Ibn Qudama's collection include depictions of pious tears, but many do not. All reports are about the righteous predecessors of the Ummah. The point, then, is to exhort readers to weep 
piously at the sight of divine mercy as embodied in the stories of the righteous. The exhortation to we should not be seen simply as a way to train the community's emotions, to discipline them, to educate them when to weep on cue. Rather, the stories of the righteous, depictions of weeping included, are meant to transfer knowledge of divine mercy to the community. Ethics transference here through literature. Again, the exhortation to weep is not a way to manage humans as mere biological entities, but to empower them by enlivening their own ethical convictions. So divine mercy embodied in the stories of the righteous is then transferred to readers who consolidate it, who are meant to consolidate it emotionally in their own souls by weeping in response. Ibn Qudama actually tells us that this is the goal in the introduction to his collection where he says, quotes, I've gathered reports to treat the hardness of my heart, reports that bring about tears, and no reports are more effective in that regard than the reports of the righteous, a salahin, at whose mention, mention of these reports, divine mercy descends and hearts are revivified. End quote. In other words, it is by observing the lives of the righteous as set forth in literature that one can observe divine mercy in real time. Impacted by divine mercy, one is moved to weep in response. Again, it is not about weeping on cue. Rather, by weeping in response to weeping that signals that divine mercy is being made available, one becomes more rooted in the ethics of God. The causality is worth highlighting. So, to observe the community's righteous predecessors in literary form is to observe divine mercy in real time. And then the sight moves one to weep. And such divinely inspired emotionality is finally productive of a more ethically sensitive soul. A couple observations on the collection of Ibn Qudama. First, it is a work of Zohut. That is, pious sentiment that sees the world as a danger to Islam. Indeed, one report suggests that the hearts of the righteous are in a permanent state of sorrow. To put it differently, the pious experience a permanent state of dissonance between the revelation of paradise and the realities of a persistently fallen world. One is to lament such a state, but not all lament is the same. Is one to weep in despair over the cause of God in this world with feelings of malice towards those forces that have humiliated it? We can discuss the ethical tone of jihadist tears in the Q&A if people would like. The weeping we're considering, as represented by Ibn Qudama's collection, has a different ethical tone. It's meant to incite a desire, not for revenge, fa'ar, against those who brought about Islam's lowly state in the world, but for mercy for one's own sins, irrespective of Islam's worldly status. In fact, one report speaks of the righteous as having no fear of worldly humiliation, dhulla dunya, nor a desire to compete for worldly might, as in dunya. Rather, they aspire for redemption. Not by displaying one's devotion to the glory of the Ummah by being a lion on the battlefield against its enemies, but by cultivating contrition in the heart, in Kisar al Qalb. Doing so by a particular, a particular kind of weeping, variously called Anin or Hamim or Aziz, Aziz with a Hamza. Weeping of this kind, as opposed to bawling or screaming or howling, signals a kind of inner movement where the body is remade. This inner movement is twofold. On the one hand, it's a sense that one's remorse is real and that one's contrition has actually taken root in the soul and so is accepted by God. Thus, on the other hand, it inspires confidence, hope, that one has been mercifully forgiven. Here, 
Weeping is accompanied by feelings not of revenge, but of spiritual consolation. Oddly, such weeping includes both fear and longing, fear that one's sins will cause one to lose paradise, and longing to be forgiven, and thus enabled to live within the light of God. The reports about Adam in Ibn Qudama's collection depict him as weeping for 300 years for his sin. He's up to his knees in his own tears. He then laughs when the angel tells him that God salutes him, confirming that he's been forgiven. That is, his, ter his tears, excuse me, his tears turn to laughter. Uh, there's a strong biblical echo in that uh, phrase. The point is, tears that bring about divine mercy cannot be mere theatrics. The fact that Adam's tears aren't just a display of piety, but are accompanied by a spirit of contrition, is signaled by a peculiar report. A thirsty eagle, gifted with the ability to speak, drinks from Adam's tears which have collected in the rocks. The eagle declares that it has tasted nothing sweeter. Adam is surprised that his own tears, the tears of a sinner, could be sweet, but the eagle has the last word. Sweet are the tears of those who disobeyed their Lord, but who then admitted their guilt, and in the process were humbled in heart and in body. The second point I'd, make, I'd like to make in uh, relation to the collection of Ibn Qudama is the prominence of King David as a model of contrite weeping. One report says that he is known in scripture as the mourner, a nawah. Significantly, his weeping is presented in distinct stages, as if landmarks to help readers discern the meanings of their own tears as they uh, progress along the spiritual life. So David is first driven by a sense of inconsolable guilt into the wilderness, where he weeps incessantly. Significantly, the beasts respond to his weeping by weeping, as do in time his fellow Israelites. Thus, this, this weeping, we're told, affects no change. He then lets out a great wail. His body shakes and is even burnt <laughs> by the intensity of his sighs. A heavenly voice then intervenes and asks David, what's the matter? Have you been wronged? Are you naked, thirsty, hungry? David responds, no, my sin has destroyed me. Still no change, we're told. Then, once the wailing has stopped, he begins to weep quietly with no voice. Anin is the term in Arabic, confirming his inner realization of divine absolution in the twofold sense. A movement within his soul has given him the conviction that God has accepted his contrition and forgiven him. That is, his soul has become more, deep, has become more deeply rooted in life in God. Another report depicts David on the pulpit on a day that is described as the day of David's mourning. His son Solomon has sent the word out, and all manner of beasts and people gather, including hermits, or Khan. They all begin to weep as soon as he starts to praise God. Some are uh, reported to actually die, likely meaning that they are emotionally overcome when he speaks of the heavenly garden and of hellfire. In other words, David having received a divine gesture into his soul as a result of his weeping, is able to transfer it from the pulpit to the congregation, inciting them to weep with powerful emotional effect, specified as either a longing uh, for the heavenly garden or a fear of hellfire. In other words, his spiritual conviction has effect on them, triggering growth in their spiritual convictions. The, ph the phenomenon still exists today in some communities whose uh, members emotionally overcome at the introduction of a divine movement into their souls through the mediation of their shaykh break into uncontrolled sobbing, which, however, is to end in weeping that is quiet but still physically noticeable. The prominence of King David in this category of lament in Islam is intriguing. The Psalms of David featured prominently in liturgical hymns in Eastern Christianity as a way to encourage pious weeping in the sense I'm tracing here. 
In other words, Muslims in the early centuries very likely, very likely developed their understanding of pious weeping in conversation with other religious traditions, Christian and no doubt Jewish too, as they existed across the Mediterranean in late antiquity. I have yet to identify a direct causal influence, although I'm getting close. Still, I think it might be better to think of the overlap in terms of a shared cultural milieu rather than a direct one-way causal influence from one tradition to another. Um, okay, um, so that's Ibn Qutama. Uh, just to give you a taste of, thing, we'll, a taste of things, uh, we'll soon move, uh, come with me, I hope you all will, to the other side of the Mediterranean, to Fez in Morocco, that's where we'll end up, where we'll consider a report on weeping in detail. Uh, but first, I'd like to share a bit more of the history of pious weeping in Islam. And again, it's, it's vast. You're just getting a small sliver of it uh, today. Um, so, um, the Quran and Hadith contain uh, depictions of tears with ethical purpose. Is the purpose of emotionality in Islam's scripture the point of origin for the kind of pious weeping I'm seeking to trace? That is pious weeping where people weep not as a public display of conformity to the authority that the figure on the pulpit represents, but as a divinely inspired emotional response. Communal weeping in response to the preacher's weeping, his weeping indicating that divine mercy is being made available to the community. Of course, it's difficult to ascertain the ethics behind the emotional rhetoric of scripture. But such rhetoric is not simply about, quote, social dynamics and power structures, end quote, as a recent article suggests. The purpose of such rhetoric in the view of that article is to trigger attachment, submission to the community and its authorities. However, the ethical purpose of depictions of weeping in the Quran becomes clearer when we read them alongside the clan poetry of the day, Shi'ara Jahiliya, where depictions of tears are often meant to prompt a desire for revenge against those who have offended the honor, the worldly glory of one's clan. Against this background, we see that the depictions of weeping in the Quran are meant not simply to bind believers together under God and God's messenger, but more precisely to soften the heart, to bring about a sense of remorse and contrition, that is, to render the heart more ethically sensitive, more attuned to the logic of honor on Judgment Day, rather than to the logic of clan honor in this world. In other words, the Quran is making a point about the ethics of human emotionality over against the cultural assumptions of its day that inform the depictions of weeping in clan poetry, which are commonly meant to harden the heart, to make it ethically insensitive, insensitive, to incite the members of one's clan to exact revenge for offenses against its worldly glory, rather than to feel remorse for its shortcomings in light of Judgment Day. So, in short, the emotional rhetoric of scripture is better read not as a kind of biopolitics, but as aiming to revivify hearts with a sense of ethical agency that is not limited to pride in and defense of one's clan. Still, despite the fact that depictions of weeping in the Quran do involve a person's ethical refashioning, as I've just suggested, still such depictions do not clearly represent the kind of tears that I seek to trace in the heritage, one where tears are a forum for spiritual discernment, particularly the, the detection of a spiritual movement, compunction, by which one knows that one's contrition has taken root and the soul it has taken root in the soul and has thus been mercifully accepted by God. It is no secret that religious reasoning of a scholastic kind, Kalam, developed in Islam during its formative period in conversation with theological currents as they had taken shape in Eastern Christianity. It is, also no secret, no, it is also no secret that the heritage of Zuhud in Islam took shape in conversation with spiritual currents in Christian monasticism as it existed in the Eastern Mediterranean region during the first centuries of Islam. And it is worth noting that Zuhud means more than the renunciation of the world. It includes discernment of one's inner life, sarira, 
is the term, whereby one seeks to know whether one's soul is oriented to this world or to the next. In other words, the historical project is not limited to collecting parallel narrative accounts and possible textual transitions from one uh, tradition to another, important as that is, the historical project also includes the task of tracing spiritual sentiments, how they have been at work in history, and how the affiliates of one religious tradition might have shared a conversation with another, here, Islam and Eastern Christianity, around the mechanics of the spiritual life and its ethical purposes. So, if you want to know history fully, you have to know your theology. And when it comes to our topic, so we're not simply saying that Muslims and Christians in the Eastern Mediterranean region swap stories about pious weeping. More specifically, we're saying they were spiritually edified by one another. So we can therefore say that the heritage of Zuhud, including its presence in the corpus of Hadith, was enriched by monastic practices of spiritual discernment, including weeping as a forum in which to detect the occurrence of compunction in the soul that tells one that one's contrition has taken root in the soul and has thus been mercifully accepted by God. Theological insight is needed to trace the contours of history, which is not only about social dynamics and power structures, but includes ethical impulses that are fortified not simply by effective, weep, uh, by effective preaching, it doesn't only, but also includes ethical impulses that are fortified not simply by effective preaching, but by the awareness of divine gestures in the soul. Not only awareness of these gestures in one's own soul, but also awareness of these gestures in the souls of the spiritually sensitive members of one's community. One work that captures the way in which monastic practices of spiritual discernment around weeping enriched the heritage of Zuhud in Islam is Ibn Abi Adunya's compilation, Sensitivity of the Heart and Weeping, which, as noted earlier, was a significant inspiration for Ibn Qudama writing later in the Levant. Let me start by noting that the dynamics of tears, as Ibn Abi Adunya's collection of reports represents them, closely aligned with perspectives on pious weeping in Eastern Christianity in at least two respects. The first is the otherworldly orientation of the weeping. More precisely, weeping is prayer-like, connecting one to the heavenly realm, serving as a weeping, serving as a forum of divine human ethics transference. The ethics transfers with the emotionality. In this respect, Lament for sin is not limited to a feeling of remorse, but includes a sense of being grafted into divine life, a highly elevated state of piety that is noticeable in the body. That is, the fruits of pious weeping, even if taking form in the inner recesses of the, of the soul, are meant to be that whole contrition thing. Still, the fruits are meant to be seen. It's a bodily thing, and therefore it's meant to be seen by others, offering a public witness to divine mercy being made available to the community in the body of the weeper. In that sense, the fruits of pious weeping are transferable. They have real effect. They serve to regenerate the community ethically. The second way in which Ibn Abi Adunya's reports on tears aligned with Eastern Christianity is the way in which weeping is religiously authorizing when, as just noted, it embodies witnesses to the mercy of God amidst the community. Indeed, the authority of the weeper on the pulpit, if the community discerns his weeping to be the fruit of real contrition and not just theatrics, can trump the emotions of the governmental and legal authorities who operate by a worldly logic of control and punishment. The tears of spiritually sensitive figures and the ethical fruit they bear enjoy a higher authority, that of divine mercy. It is worth noting that King David is also the model par excellence of pious weeping in Ibn Abi Adunya's collection. Here too, his weeping is presented in stages. He only accepts that he has received divine mercy, his, tr his sin truly forgiven, when his wailing, Nahib, ceases and he weeps quietly as a child might when being consoled by a parent. Here, too, 
Anin is the term to signal that the weeping is not exuberant, sobbing, which is never stable and therefore cannot confirm that the soul's roughness, Jaffa, has been conquered. Weeping softly is the outward sign that contrition has taken root in the soul and has thus been accepted by God. Indeed, even God's declaration to David that he is forgiven is not enough to convince him. In other words, weeping, as Ibn Abi Adunya's collection represents it, is not a merely biological process, emotional release that makes one feel better. Rather, David has to do the spiritual discernment. It's not enough. Spiritual discernment is needed to ascertain that repentance has taken place in one's soul, the contrition is real, the weeping redemptive. That is, that it has made one more attuned to the righteousness of God and not simply made one feel better. The reports on David indicate spiritual progress in this sense. He is remade bodily. His joints actually are depicted coming undone by his weeping and then being refashioned as he senses that his soul has returned to him anew. And his weeping introduces him into life in God's light, nor. His extended weeping over sin, it's not a perverse expression of self-loathing as modernist sentiment might judge, but it's actually a process of becoming empowered by divine mercy and thus more sensitive, more merciful towards others. Once David realizes that his crime has truly been forgiven, he then weeps with other sinners. In sum, one is to make efforts. One is, one is to make efforts to weep by recalling one's sins in light of the prospect of hellfire. But the new life, the new life that weeping yields is a heavenly initiative that one has to discern within. But how is one to know that a heavenly initiative has happened? The evidence is the sense of compunction in the heart, a spiritual movement experienced as a burning or a stinging. And it's here that we can see most clearly the, the, the connection between Islam and Eastern Christianity. A burning accompanies David's tears. When David sighs, he shakes and is burnt. He's been stung in his soul, but it's also bodily, a physical reality signaled by the fact that the grass around him gets burned up. So, significantly, Ibn Abi Adunya includes reports in other sections of his compilation that specify the nature of this inner stinging. The term he uses, or in the reports, uh, the term in Arabic is hurqa, hurqa, which also uh, features in secular poetry as evidence of one's longing for one's beloved. The usage of the term in Ibn Abi Adunya's collection seems to parallel closely the notion of compunction, uh, katanuxus in the Greek, in the spiritual heritage of Eastern Christianity, which is also described as a stinging, and which too is taken as evidence that one's contrition has been accepted by God. In other words, the logic of pious weeping is not societal expectation, uh, but a movement in the soul, compunction. It's clear in Ibn Abi Dunya. This compunction itself, the result of one's contrition for sin, but also the soul's burning for God. So the ultimate cause of the tears is not a concern for status in society, which one could jeopardize if one did not display emotional conformity to society's hierarchies. Rather, the ultimate cause of the tears is the hope of receiving a share in God's mercy. Interestingly, one report uh, explains harqa in terms that are both spiritual and medical. Quote, uh, the eye does not moisten until the heart burns, so if the heart burns, its flame blazes, its smoke then rises to the head, and it then makes tears descend uh, to the eye, um, and then the eye ducks flow with tears, end quote. Uh, in other words, weeping of this kind is not something one control, can control. If the heart's burning is particularly intense, one weeps against one's will and without the need for pious exhortation. Uh, one report describes the process, um, and I'm paraphrasing. Sorrow first spreads throughout the body and then settles in the heart. There it has its effect, causing a burning, a that stirs up tears uh, in the head, uh, which then deliver them to the eyes. 
Noteworthy are the reports that indicate that people other than the weeper can sense whether the weeper's tears are divinely inspired or not by assessing the effect they have on their own souls. As a figure in one report uh, remarks, quote, I have never had a greater pleasure, nor have I enjoyed a greater comfort than in the presence of those who cry with a burning heart cup, end quote. In short, if one's uh, tears are not truly tears of contrition, only a show of piety, people will not be ethically affected by them. They might be affected by them in other ways, but they won't be ethically uh, regenerated by them. But when the tears are accompanied by the burning of compunction, itself prompted by a divine gesture in the weeper's soul, they, the others, will, will be affected by them. The heart, then, is the authority, not only the heart of the pious weeper, but also the hearts of those who detect a divine agency in the weeper's tears. The impression that Ibn Abi Adunya's collection conveys is that tears out of reverence of God, Allah, not only deliver one from hellfire, they also introduce a divine light into one's limbs, endowing the body with a spirit of humility, but also enabling it with agency to partake in God's mission in the world, namely the spread of divine mercy to others. Weeping, when divinely inspired, is a cause of divine mercy, not only as forgiveness for one's own sin, but also for the spiritual edification of the community. As one report uh, puts it, um, as one report puts it, quote, when one cries sincerely to God in a gathering, all are forgiven by the blessing of, the, of his weeping, end quote. By responding not simply to tears, but to the devotion to God that accompanies them, others are themselves moved to weep and have their hearts softened by divine mercy. The emotionality, divine mercy, uh, divinely inspired in this case, the emotionality divinely inspired in this case, is a shared emotionality. In this sense, the tears of the weeper um, who causes others to weep is not only apotropaic. Uh, the tears of the holy person do not only aim to ward off God's wrath at a sin-plagued sin community, uh, they are also redemptive, communicating a blessing to others so that they too might witness, experience divine mercy and be remade by it. Weeping is then not a way to demonstrate, show off one's piety, and get others on board with it. It is ethically regenerating, thus divinely authorizing, and as we'll see in a moment, able to challenge governmental arrogance uh, um, if, if needed. Um, so uh, to, to kind of cl conclude, if I can just take another five minutes before Q&A. Uh, so there, I've just kind of thrown all sorts of things at you. Uh, uh, one heritage of, of weeping, uh, there are multiple, uh, and just a kind of a small slice of it to give you a taste of it. But we have a historical report uh, that I think nicely illustrates all, all the things that I've been saying. And so if I can uh, uh, pass out this, uh, that's enough. Uh, pass them back there. Um, so, um, Everyone have one? Yeah. So I'm just going to look at the front side. Uh, back side is quotes from Ibn Abi Adunya if you want to look at them later. Or, um, but the front side, uh, page one, is what I'm looking for, um, uh, looking at. Um, this report, um, this page long report, comes from a 14th century work on the history of Morocco by a scholar from Fez. Um, his name is Ibn Abi uh, Zara al Fasi. Uh, and in this report, uh, a pious figure by the name of Abu Amran Musa has just learned that he's been appointed as preacher in the main mosque of the city, that's al Um And so let me just read the whole report. And then I'll just have a few concluding remarks and then we can open it up for discussion. So, uh, when his appointment to give the sermon reached him, Abu Amran Musa was stunned. He sent away the children and he began to weep and invoke God, saying, O oh God, don't scandalize me amidst your servants, O oh, oh most merciful one. When it was Thursday morning, he went to the Rabita. I imagine you all know that's a place associated with spiritual practices of Sufism. So when he went, uh, he went to, on the Thursday morning, he went to the Rabita outside one of the gates of Fez and began to walk amidst the graves of the righteous. Okay? Invoking God and weeping until evening came when he entered the Rabita. 
So he's moving from the graveyard alone to the Rabitza, where he spent the night with a group of the people of Kaun, that's probably other affiliates of the Rab uh, Rabitza. The entire night he was praying, reciting the Quran, invoking God, and crying. And the people were weeping on account of his weeping and humility until morning. He ascended, okay, now we're on Friday. Uh, he ascended the pulpit and did not stop or stammer, then entered the niche, the mihrab. So notice, he's no longer giving the chutbah, he's descended from the minbar, and he's now in the, the, uh, the niche. He bestowed wisdom and explained the sermon. He wept and made those who heard him weep. When the prayer ended, um, the people approached him to kiss his hand and get a blessing from him. Uh, he continued to be the preacher until the arrival of the jurist and judge, a figure named Muhammad ibn Maymun al Hawari, whose first question for the people of the city was about the preacher of al Qaruin, that is, this Abu Amr al Musa. They all spoke well of him and praised him a lot. However, when Friday came, he, the judge, saw him. He found his image displeasing and regarded him as ugly. He said something about him, that is, the judge said something about the preacher, and one of those who was present said, well, if you heard his sermon, he would please you. When the judge heard his sermon, he wept and asked him for forgiveness and to invoke God on his behalf. So, in light of our reflections on pious weeping in Islam, or the sliver that we've looked at, we have a better sense of how to read this passage. It is not communal weeping on cue. It is not weeping as a function of societal expectation. Three points can be made. The weeping begins as a private matter and then gradually becomes public. The author knows that pious, the, 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 author, the author therefore knows that, that, that pious weeping has its origin in the soul. In short, the causal source of the weeping is not the public setting, but the heart of the preacher. The congregation, report, the, 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 the congregation weeps in, re, in response to his tears because of the spirit or ethical tone his tears contain. Second, the passage, associate, the passage associates the preacher's weeping with the congregation's desire to seek a blessing from him. His weeping had made them weep, not because they felt pressured to do so, but because they sensed that his tears are, are divinely inspired. His tears have ethical impact on them, kind of signaled with the idea of the baraka. Third, um, the Sharia authority of Hawaii, uh, he succumbs in the end. Uh, pious weeping represents a religious authority that can trump the law, the law which requires humans to interpret it. As such, the law is less certain than one's own experience of divine activity, that is, God's mercy, in one's tears. So, to conclude, uh, the full weight of Islam's heritage of weeping is at play in this text. It is not about conformity, but shared emotionality that communicates a sense of God's mercy. Tears as concrete evidence that God's blessing is being made available to the community. So we need to be careful about reading such narratives through the lens of our own uh, so, uh, through the lens of our own assum uh, assumptions of emotionality as a private affair, rather than a blessing to be shared. We see publicly, we today, we tend to see publicly performed emotionality as theatrics, because we're often blind to the real possibility that such emotionality is the fruit of a community's discernment of God's mercy at work in the souls of its spiritually sensitive members. And we're blind to that real possibility because we assume that emotionality is not to be shared and thus is not meant to be ethically edifying for the community as a whole. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, Paul. I, I heard some talks in my life. This was, I think, one one of the richest and deepest uh, I, so I've ever heard. So we are all rewarded for being here, and I'm very happy we recorded this. This was amazing. And I have about 20 questions, but I, I will retain, <laughs> retain, retain myself. We just don't need to cry together now to really. And then, <laughs> then uh, what, what is... Um, 
So what I would like to ask you, is it okay to, to keep the, uh, the recording going um, for the questions? Or if you, you mind, is that it's switch it up? Okay, let's go, let's go. So, questions. Yes, uh, uh, Dilan. Yes, um, you talked about the people being inspired to weep um, when uh, that, how it's, it's pious tears would be inspired when um, reading or hearing about the righteous predecessors of the dunya. And I'm wondering if there's anything written about what happens when people don't weep. Uh, like if, if there is, say, like a sermon or something that is given and some people weep and others don't, is that commented on, is that noticed? Yeah, um, yeah, it's a really good question. And so you, you have some reports in Ibn Abi Adunya's uh, work where they're all in the congregation and like, you know, everyone's weeping except these guys. Um, and like it's, as the, the report I'm recalling, it's like a father or son. Um, and like the son says to the father, <laughs> why aren't we weeping? Um, and I can't remember all the details of how the conversation uh, transpires, but I think uh, Ibn Abi Adunya includes, uh, includes reports like that um, as, a, as a kind of um, um, confirmation that this shouldn't just be automatic. Yeah, and um, I think they eventually kind of get to the point later where they start weeping, but it's, it's kind of a nice foil. Um, and, you know, there's also some much more kind of baldly stated um, reports where it's like, well, you know, someone could be crazy and they're weeping, um, you know, and, and so all of his work, and I don't know if you're familiar with Ibn Abiyah Dunya, we've got a lot of his, a lot of his works, uh, but they come across just as collections of reports, but, but the more, you know, I've, I've read this one like a dozen times, and the more uh, you read it, you realize he's got a, a, a vision. Um, and so he's collecting reports um, that um, you know don't at first seem to kind of fit. Well, they're not weeping, right? But actually, you know, in the larger vision that he's trying to convey, you, you see that no, he's he's actually saying, well, yeah, um, we should be a little circumspect here. We should be a little circumspect. Uh, you know, he also um, includes a, a report. Um, you know, I have it here on the back page. Um, um, this is another example, maybe I could just read through it quickly, uh, it's on page two at the bottom. Um, this is Abdul Malik, the great Umayyad Caliph. Uh, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan looked at a man who prostrated in prayer at length. When he raised his head, the Caliph saw the place of his prostration wet with tears. He then, the Caliph sent a man after that guy, saying, when he finishes his prayer, bring him to me so that I can examine his mind. Right? So there is this concern about, about you know, on, in, the guys who don't pray are now the, the, the caliph, but in this story it's going to boomerang back against the caliph. So when he, the, that, that reaper, finished his prayer, he was brought to him, the caliph, and Abdul Malik said to him, I've seen you do something that isn't required to attain paradise. That is, it's not legally authorized. The man then let out a shriek that terrified Abdul Malik and then fainted. He awoke at length. Uh, he awoke at length. Um, he, he, where am I? He, he awoke at length, wiping the sweat from his face, saying, "And it's clear that he's addressing God. He's oblivious to the caliph, and he says, "Perish the one who disobeys you, God." In other words, he's indicating that we must o obey the divinely inspired inner movements and not just the Sharia rulings. Uh, he, uh, Yala, one of the guys, the guy who's reporting this, then said, "Then Abdul Malik began to weep, while the man turning his back." Um, uh, and, and paying no attention to the caliph um, left him. Um, yeah, and, and so, um, um, right, and so, I mean, firstly, this is another one of many examples where the pious weeping trumps the governmental authority. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can see, um, even this is a little different from the question you asked, you can see that, that, that he's got a concern, that there's clearly a discourse going on in society um, about you know, I mean, it, it's true today between Sufis and Salafis. I mean, uh, Sufis love to weep, and, and Salafis weep too, but for very different reasons. And um, the Sufi, I don't know if you're familiar with Al-Habib uh, Ali Al-Jafri, he's always making his community weep, and they're, you know, and a guy like uh, Abdul Baz, Ibn, um, Abdul Aziz Ibn Baz, uh, before, yeah, 
I mean, he, they, no, this is all, this is all ridiculous. This is, uh, you're losing your ritual decorum. Um, the point is, is if you weep, okay, you know, I mean, there's hadith and Quran verses that, you know, legitimize it, but you should weep with fortitude, with, with sabr, so that it doesn't overcome you, um, right? Um, the idea of the dry literalist salafis of the weeping so yeah, exactly, Ex exactly. Although, I mean, then you have guys like Salah al um he's weeping all the time, and, you know, I mean, we can get into that, but anyways, this is probably more uh, than you had thought. Um, but, but yeah, all I'm saying is that there are all, all these reports that, that, you know, have people who aren't weeping, you know. Um, like, what about Hajj, like, on Arafah, if you're not crying, to make a crying face. Mm -hmm. You know, at least try to judge. Yeah, yeah, a tabaki, yeah. a tabaki, yeah, yeah. There's the buka, and then, but then there's uh, the tabaki. Um, yeah. Um, I'm thinking specifically Christian. of a line in a Latmiya from, uh, like an Azari Latmiya from Iran that says, "If my, if, when I cannot cry, I feel shame." Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah. So, look, I. I'm not suggesting that there isn't societal pressure. I mean, you know, Muslims, like all people, we live within these realities. Uh, but I just want to say that the tradition is very aware that, that it has to be more than theatrics. Um, and, and so it, it is concerned about that type of um, false or uh, affected weeping. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, there's also this encouragement to weep uh, if you can't. Uh, I mean, so long as you're doing it sincerely, the idea is to grow in the virtue of weeping so that eventually it will be truly contrite. Uh, yeah. Um, there might be a distinction between Sunni and Shia at that point. Really. Yeah, I mean, that. Sunni Shia might have a distinction. There. I've been thinking about that line for a couple of years since I first heard it, and the interesting thing to me is that there there is a sort of societal expectation that you do cry during, mm -hmm. like, Muharram generally, yeah. but then there is an acknowledgement that sometimes you don't, right? Like, yeah. well, I cannot cry, and yeah. it's not that he forces himself to. He says, when he cannot cry, I feel yeah. shame. Yeah. But there is a, and is it because, is it, why do I feel shame? Because it, it looks like. I'm not with the group, or because it's a sign of something else. What? Why is the shame? I, What's the I sh pulled up the, yeah. the, the text of it. Okay. Check, uh, you, oh, when you cry, it's like a sign of you're blessed. Yeah. No, no. This oh, you're really feeling it. Right, right. Yeah. Well, well, I've heard this uh, when I was in Iran, like uh, in TVs. Uh, the guys who's trying to make people cry. It's like uh, to one who crying, you are blessed, and to those who try harder or I don't know, listen. It, yeah. Carefully yeah. to be inspired, inspired in yeah. Yeah. by God or yeah. whoever to uh, bless you and pray. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's this uh, Ibn, Ibn al Qayyim um, um, says, In uh, Qasa al Qalb, what is the word? Uh, if, 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 the, if, the, if the heart is hard, um, you can I make it uh, yeah. so weak? No, but but yeah, you you if you're if you have a, a hard heart, you won't weep. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the? Uh, I can't remember what the. But yeah. Um, what is that? Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah. Uh, so I, I was asking whether it was a sense that maybe I'm not weeping. Do I have a hard heart? Or or. That's what I. That's what no, I. No, from the. Te it seems to be more that you're that if uh, you're not feeling inspired at that moment. Ah, like okay, like, right. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah. Oh, it's right. He later it, says, "Oh, I, I, I uh, sleep and see the the road to the haram, and then I cried." Ah, okay. Yeah. So these techniques to kind of encourage uh, weeping. Um, yeah, it's um, in in qasa al qalb qahatat al al ain is what it is. If if the if the um, heart is hard. Um, um, the um, the eye is dry, but but you're you're talking about something else. And I think this just was put in that order to rhyme. Like I, yeah, <laughs> like I right, 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 right. Um, but just yeah, one point there. I mean, I I think um, you know today. I mean, you see all sorts of YouTube videos. These they seem to be more Salafi. I don't focus so much on the Shi, but but also with these things to encourage people to weep. Uh, and you can see how like maybe this might have started in this conversation with Eastern. Uh, monasticism, but it's been definitely streamlined, and so they don't so much talk about harqa today, but they'll talk about uh, alam al qalb or waqs, waqs al, al qalb. Waqs is like the prick of a pin, uh, waqs al qalb, uh, um, and of course it's it's most commonly associated with the, the talawat al Quran, um, mm. um, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, um, right. It's 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 a balance. I mean, there might be an encouragement. To, but in the end, you know, it, it should be real, and, and I, I think these, these questions are, it, it, this, this discourse is still at play uh, vastly today. But isn't it like, like even like sometimes when you, 
uh, force yourself to cry. Like it's also like commanded, like in hadith, right? Like in yeah. if you don't cry, then make yourself. Cry. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is like it might be like for like like for the intention of being inspired or for the intention of weeping. Exactly. Know? Yeah. Exactly. So it's, so even if it is not like genuine, yeah. like weeping at that moment, it might be like it has the intention of that. Of reaching that spirituality. It, it, exactly. It's, it's the same thing about faith. You know? Mm -hmm. That if you don't don't have it, at least try and do as you have it. So there is some, something like this. And then it will come. Yeah. Actually if you if you act act it for yourself and others it, it can help you to yeah. to, 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 to come. To yeah. That. And you also have the, the wajd and the tawajid. The wajd and the tawajid and Interestingly, the Bukha, like there's a 14th century Egyptian guy, he has this book, Raud al Fariq fi al Mu'ayyid wa Raqa'iq. His name is Shu'ayb, I think, al Hurayfish. And he's connecting the, the weeping with the Wajd, the Bukha and the Wajd. But that's a whole nother, and a whole nother direction uh, uh, to this. Um, yeah, I think I was going to say something else. Um, yeah. Uh, um, you want to grow in that virtue of, of weeping because some of the guys said you're not going to get to paradise unless you weep. Yeah, that, that's really, I mean, not all. I mean, Abdulaziz Ibn Baz does not say that. He says um, it's it's um, it's 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 mustahab. Uh, uh, it's it's good. It's good, uh, but um, it's not required. It's not required to weep. But but others say you know you've really got to weep because uh, that. Is a process that helps your uh, repentance uh, be fully realized, uh, concretely realized, and, and, and then to really be uh, uh, the abode of divine mercy, as, as it were. Um, yeah, uh, and so, you know, um, we, we have, uh, of course, hadith and other reports of the prophet weeping. Um, I mean, you know, uh, weeping at the death of his grandson, uh, I think, but, but not weeping out of despair, weeping uh, out of compassion, right? There was a whole, uh, Leor, Leor Halavi has a whole book on weeping for the dead and, you know, what's acceptable and what's not. Uh, but yeah, in the Hadith, there's this, it's building off a Quranic verse where, you know, the Prophet is uh, described as the Shaheed on Judgment Day, he's the Shaheed for the Ummah. Um, and now in that uh, Quranic verse, it doesn't say anything about weeping, but then there's a hadith that says, well, then that's why he weeps so much, because he sees all the sins of his community, and he's going to have to witness that on, 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 on Judgment Day, um, and therefore, as it were, his, his tears are going to intercede. His tears are the conduit of divine mercy, right, interceding. Um, and so again, there you have the, the shared emotionality in the tradition. And so, um, especially in the uh, heritage of Sufism, the awliya, um, their bodies are, are incorporating the body of the prophet, and therefore the emotionality of the prophet. And so they can, they can communicate that, that, um, that, that mercy through the tears that inspire mercy. Um, uh, that inspire that inspire tears in, in response to that. The ethics transfer with the shared emotionality, and this is where Salafism is very modern. You know, because there are hadith where you have to, you know, there are hadith where the prophet weeps and Sahaba weep, and so yeah, it's for Salafism, it's legitimate to weep. Um, but uh, Salah al Maghamsi, I mean, he actually has some really interesting explanations of of why we weep, and it's a kind of um, it's a kind of chaufan min naqmatullah and shawqan il rahmatullah, right? This is what he says. And you can say these can happen sponta uh, simultaneously and all of that. Um, but that's about, it, your weeping then indicates the state of your soul. But you can't, he would never say, even though he goes in different directions than, than uh, Ibn Baz, he would never say, then I can communicate that to you. He would say, you too should do this. But you know, as opposed to the, the Sufi tradition and today, as in the past, uh, they would say no, um, the Shaykh can mediate that prophetic emotionality and therefore that prophetic ethics or 
that divine mercy. Um, Does yeah. it, do they ever tell what the mechanism is by which it's transferred from one person to another? Yeah, not in the text on weeping that I've read, and I sometimes like I sometimes feel I'm just at the beginning here. Yeah. Uh, but you do find that in other um, Sufi texts. I mean, Sufi, whatever you know, the akhlaq heritage. Um, um, there's an interesting um, 18th century Moroccan um, and others at that time, but the one I'm thinking of is this is a, a, a treatise by uh, uh, Abdulaziz ibn Dabar, or yeah, um, I mean it's, it's, it's records of his saying by one of his students, like yeah, Mamati or something, um, and there's a really interesting explanation of how you take on the prophetic body and the prophetic 